We have just wrapped up week 3 of Mythic Plus Dragonflight Season 1. This was the first pseudo push week with somewhat easy or forgiving affixes being Sanguine, Volcanic and Fortified. And in this video I'm going to be discussing a couple of things that I've been noticing from the keys I've been running on my healers as well as how it looks like the healer meta is shaping up and how I think that is going to be possibly changing over the next couple of weeks as well as looking at the Dungeon Ease tier list. This is the kind of comparison between the difficulty level of the eight dungeons in season one mythic plus a couple of things i've been noticing this week from the healers that i've been playing or the, the keys i've been running is that it feels somewhat more difficult than in previous seasons to play off meta community perception for some healers isn't great at the moment and the same is also true for tanks and i've found that if i'm playing an off meta healer like resto shaman disc priest or mistweaver one of the things that has a big impact on my ability to heal those keys is how much babysitting or, or healing the tank requires. If I'm doing keys with like prot warriors or even blood DKs or really good vengeance demon hunters that really don't require much healing at all from me, I find that makes a big difference in my ability to heal keys. I have done a couple of keys this week with brewmasters and even though they have been seemingly quite good players, the amount of extra throughput I needed to push on every single pack to keep them alive meant that I sometimes I didn't have cooldowns or resources available to do the group healing for unavoidable mechanics because I was instead using those on healing the tank up. So I think I can kind of summarize this first point in that the difference between really good groups and bad groups is I think the highest it's ever been in any season of Mythic Plus. You can get a tank that's really undergeared or playing very off meta and it can make keys quite difficult. I think the same is also probably true for healers. So I'm assuming a lot of DPS players and tank players are looking at like Resto Shamans and Disc Priests and thinking a lot of mechanics are quite difficult to heal. So why would I want to take the risk and picking an off meta healer? From the keys I've been playing this week, the thing that is standing out the most to me is that the difference between good groups and bad groups is probably the largest it's ever been. This, to me, the difference between good groups and bad groups can be the culmination or the result of quite a few variables. So playing meta specs, playing the specs well with good players, as well as route, obviously coordinating kicks the specific specs you choose to bring, things like that. As an example, I went into a Halls of Valor naively on my Disc Priest with a, I believe it was a Warlock and a Mage, which meant that we really only had two kicks, two proper melee kicks between us in the whole group. And that meant that on the last boss, it was very easy for like one small misplay or miscommunication to be a bricked key because the ad that spawns on the last boss that has to be kicked and killed wasn't kicked. And I think this is a somewhat decent example of what a lot of people are struggling with right now. Not only is the difference between good groups and bad groups stark at the moment, the difficulty of a lot of dungeons is much higher than in previous Mythic Plus seasons. And it's very easy to get to a point where if you have a group that all play perfectly, then you can certainly time keys and, and not have a problem with particular specs. But the real question is, how close to like the nice edge do you want to play? If you have a group with all melee kicks and a healer with a kick, well then one or two overlap kicks here and there probably isn't going to be a big deal. But if you're playing in a group where the healer doesn't have a kick and two of the DPS have kicks on 21 second cooldowns or something, all of a sudden one overlapped kick or one miscommunication can be the difference between timing a key and bricking a key. And I think that's reflected in Subcreation's healer tier list for this week. I think that's roughly what is reflected with a lot of tier lists at the moment. While high keys and a lot of things may be possible with perfect play with any combination or number of different specs, the real question is which specs can you play which give you the highest chance of success? And for most groups that's Resto Druid because they have excess throughput, they have great utility, they have a normal kick and everything, they have good personal defensives, all of that kind of stuff. Same thing with Preservation and Holy Paladin, not to the same extent as Resto Druid probably for most people, but those are healing specs that can cover for mistakes, that have short cooldown kicks, that have good utility, can stay alive with a quick personal cooldown if they have to, if things go wrong. And then the Holy Priest, Dispriest, Resto Shaman, 
that sub creation has in C tier feel like the healers at the moment that don't necessarily have the excess throughput that the other three healers do and therefore it is easier to fail certain mechanics or at least more difficult to beat certain healing checks. Sub creation also has Mistweaver in F tier. I think whether or not you agree with this is going to come down to whether or not you compare healers against other healers or whether or not you look at the tier list as what is possible. So if you have a group that plays around a Fist Weaver and you have a Fist Weaver that's an excellent player and you're happy to kind of pass some of the uh, responsibility of staying alive off to the DPS and the tanks because the, the healer doesn't have the kind of throughput that other healers have, then I think Mist Weaver can be okay. And I think the people who think about the tier list in that sense disagree with Mist Weaver being an F tier. But the people that look at their healer tier list and just think like, what is the difference between Resto Druid and Miss Weaver? That's where you get such a large disparity between S tier and F tier. I hope I've done a somewhat decent job of explaining that, I guess. This is from my personal play, at least from for the keys I've done. Miss Weaver has felt like a feast or famine healer. There are some situations where Fist Weaver or Miss Weaver feels excellent. As an example, I did a ruby life pools and I was fist weaving got to the first boss and I was able to drop a feline stomp on the boss as the whelps were spawning and then basically just stand there spamming spinning crane kick with one button to do really good HPS to heal through the frost shield damage going out by just hitting the whelps and I could do I could heal through that difficult mechanic for a lot of healers very easily on a Mistweaver by pressing one button while being able to move around with an ability that doesn't spend banner. So in that sense, in that situation, it worked out really well. But I've also had other groups on the same boss even where if the tank moves the boss around a lot, uh, I often can't even be standing in my Feline Stomp to fist weave that boss. So in those situations, fist weaving has just not worked at all for me sometimes. And that is what, yeah, that is what Miss Weaver feels like to me. Sometimes it works great and sometimes it doesn't. Generally speaking, if I'm healing scenarios or environments where I can hit multiple mobs and I can stay in melee range and not really have to deal with mechanics or worry about movement or running things out of the group or anything like that, then fist weaving generally feels good and in situations where I can only hit one mob or situations where my fist weaving is interrupted by having to do mechanics or there's a lot of movement or ground effects to avoid and things like that that's when fist weaving really I start to struggle with it. There are a couple of other examples that I've run into on other healers that sometimes I just think to myself I don't know I either don't know how I would have healed through that on a mist weaver or I just don't think I would have healed through it at all on a mist weaver full stop and that is something like the Overlap with the runic brand going out on the last boss halls of valor at the same time as the swords exploding That really is like a prey You just hope that revival is enough to keep your teammates alive while you're running because you can't really do any healing on the move And you don't have anything to melee But then there are other situations like the Alcathar Academy tree boss where being able to fist weave the little ads that spawn all the time makes fist weaving feel excellent in that situation. So like I said, fist weaving has been much of a feast or famine for me. Sometimes it feels great and works well and sometimes it doesn't. And I think the absolute best players with the best groups that are willing to work around the times where Mistweaver doesn't work well, they can make Mistweaver look decent, but it still doesn't really compare to what other healers can do in those same situations where Mistweaver struggles. As far as Druids being in S tier, I don't think that is particularly surprising to most people. Everyone knows by now why Resto Druids are strong and that they're strong. I think the interesting dynamic that may be unfolding in the next couple of weeks is I think Preservation and Resto Druid effectively swap places. I think Preservation becomes S tier and Druid either stays S or goes down to A along with Holy Paladin that moves from B to A. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think Preservation is the best healer in very high groups, in very good groups. And I think Paladin and Druid are about equal but slightly below Preservation at the moment. The reason I think this is Preservation's minor weaknesses at the moment is first the range issue and the best groups can play around that without any major kind of downsides. And the second one is that Preservation is a healer that functions via spending short-term cooldowns and resources to heal. And in pug groups and in somewhat lower keys, not like the, the very tippity top of the mountain for the very elite players, but 
for most people, they're going to be playing with tanks that still require a bit of healing. There's still going to be some mistakes and, and suboptimal comps and kicks missed and things that mean that preservation evokers still have to heal some avoidable damage in keys. And in that situation, preservation being A tier feels about right to me. Where I think preservation really excels is situations where they can use all of their resources and cooldowns on healing only the unavoidable damage in, in keys. So as the group gets better and the keys get higher and people do a better job of avoiding all of the possible damage they can, I think that's where preservation gets better and better. As an example, if you're doing, let's say, last boss quarter stars, Melandris, if you're playing a preservation evoker and you need to heal that boss fight and you still have to do some tank healing and you still have to heal up a couple of DPS who get hit by the, the lines on the ground, then preservation is okay. If you're playing preservation and you're healing that boss and you only have to heal slicing winds and nothing else, then all of a sudden you can use all of your essence on spreading your echoes to get your verdant embrace off as slicing winds is starting and, and that kind of that that's the efficiency that makes preservation a bit better than resto druid as keys get higher in my opinion. I also think preservation does a better job of healing burst damage and at the moment Subcreation is looking at keys ranging from difficulty 17 to 25. I think as that number starts increasing and people push higher and higher keys, again, I think that's where preservation shines because it, it can heal burst damage much more quickly. And a lot of the times it's something like the duo boss, the second last boss in Noku Defensive, where the archer will shoot out the gale arrow on everyone that damages the whole party and then I think it was about two seconds later, that archer will then quick shot somebody. And if you can't top up health bars very quickly, the quick shot can easily kill in higher keys. As far as Holy Priest, Dis Priest, and Resto Shaman go, it makes sense to me that these are three healers that are all stuck in the same kind of boat. The throughput on those three healers isn't crazy. It isn't the same kind of throughput that Preservation and Resto Druid have specifically. And they aren't as tanky as Paladin. They also pay a much higher price for tank healing than Paladin does. So Paladins can kind of put beacon on decent tanks, go into pretty much any key and just heal the normal like group damage and keep the tank alive while focusing only on like strong triage healing with Holy Shock and group healing with Light of Dawn. They also have the option of taking very good group healing when they need it for kind of cooldown scenarios through Beacon of Virtue. And I think those two things at the moment, along with their good defensives, is what puts them in a slightly higher tier than Holy Priest, Dis Priest, Resto Shaman. Resto Shaman, especially not having an external, is holding them back a bit. Their group healing in from the keys I've done has actually felt pretty good. I also think that as they get more and more critical strike on gear and they get their two and four piece bonuses, I think their cooldown healing and their group healing becomes really quite good. And the only question mark is really how much is not having an external going to hold them back and community perception. I think Holy Priest is similar to Resto Shaman, but I think Holy Priest has better rotational, like non cooldown normal throughput, but much weaker cooldown throughput. Apotheosis just isn't a very strong cooldown and their group healing is also a little limited by positioning. They kind of need to lean on Holy Word Sanctify to really pump out the, the AoE group healing. At the start of the week I would have been fairly happy to keep, at least in my personal opinion, keep Dis Priest in the same kind of group, in the same category. But after playing it all week, I actually think Disc is a little bit better than, well, most people realize at the moment. I personally have started stacking Mastery along with haste but but really focusing on mastery to improve my atonement healing my kind of combo aoe healing like being able to combine power word radiance into schism into penance into mind games into halo haste is a stat that doesn't affect the healing on any of those abilities but it does allow you to combo them together more quickly which is great but then stacking as much mastery as possible has really helped those abilities feel much stronger in a group healing environment in my opinion at least for me this week my disc priest is only like 385 or 382 for most of the week i think and i was able to quite comfortably pretty much sustain 50k hps on, on quite a few boss fights even more on the boss fights like stone step and tempest that give you a buff 
through the mechanics of the boss to increase your throughput, your healing throughput. I think if the 10.0.5 changes went live for Disc right now, I think Disc could very well be competitive with at least Holy Paladin, probably even a little bit better than Holy Paladin. And I think once people get the kind of the, the right healing trinkets they want and they have all the right kind of throughput and stat allocations that they're comfortable with then I think we'll see Discipline Priest especially kind of gain comparative to other healers because at the moment the one thing that really kind of feels like it's holding them back more than anything else is their sustained group healing and that is what I feel like mastery helps address and what the 10.0.5 changes also go a long way to improving. As far as the dungeon ease tier list goes it isn't all too surprising to me that, I mean, everyone knows Shadow Moon Burial Grounds is basically a free key at the moment. There are no damage checks, no healing checks, no real mechanic checks. There isn't much that's difficult about this dungeon at all. It's also got a very lenient timer, which means groups don't have to do anything crazy. They can just go into Burial Grounds, pull one pack at a time, focus on defensives and like playing safe and have no real problems timing the key. As far as Court of Stars goes, I feel like the only thing holding it back from also being in S tier is Melandris, the slicing wins on the last boss. The rest of the dungeon has been pretty well figured out since Legion. Groups are very efficient now with their routes and even pulling multiple trash packs at once if they know they can handle it. It isn't particularly mechanics heavy on any of the trash either. A couple of things you can line of sight, a couple of things need to be kicked and that's, I mean, that's pretty much it for the most part. It really comes down to whether or not your healer can keep your group alive on the last boss and that's it. What is surprising is not good offensive being in B tier. I think most people thought of Ruby Life Pools and not good offensive as being similarly difficult in previous weeks. And what's really separated not good out as being an easier key than the rest, it seems, is the nerfs to the trash packs around the burial grounds in particular. I think what this has allowed is for groups to get much more efficient routes, which has simultaneously made the trash itself easier to deal with, but also made getting count much more efficient, which has added a little bit of extra time for most groups. None of the bosses are particularly difficult other than the healing check on Tempest. I found that the higher I get in this, almost the easier it becomes to heal. And that is because DPS do a better job of staying in closer to the boss, which means staying in range of the healer at all times, and then just collecting the orbs as they come into the boss, rather than running around all over the area trying to collect all the orbs. This week there are a couple of hotfixes for not good offensive as well, specifically to the Tempest boss, and that is that the duration of the debuff from collecting the orbs to increase your damage and healing has been increased by 3 seconds. This is going to be great. This allows, I think it allows for the healer or well, everyone to basically maintain the orb debuff for the entire fight. This is both going to make it easier to heal, less movement required, and it's going to make the boss die quicker for almost all groups at the moment. So that's going to make that boss much more manageable. And the second last boss, the duo, the ghosts, at the moment, the kind of difficult part about that fight is that right after the Gale arrow goes out, which is the arrow that goes onto everyone in the party that causes damage and spawns the tornadoes or the cyclones, ability that goes out after that is quick shot. And the challenge last week has been to top the group up quickly enough such that the quick shot doesn't one shot whoever it targets after the Gale arrow. That was about a two second window, uh, now it's getting changed or it's getting increased by two seconds so that will be a four second window which will again also make that boss much more manageable. The final five dungeons in the C, D and F tier, it looks like are all getting changes except for Azua Vaults really, are all getting changes that are going to make these Again, probably much more balanced or in line with the other dungeons. At the moment, it seems like the old dungeons, so Temple of the Jade Serpent and Halls of Valor, are in these lower tiers simply because their timer is quite tight and they have a few bosses that can be difficult to heal. In Temple of the Jade Serpent, it, that is the second last boss and last boss. I think most groups, now that they realize that you can use the debuff on Stone Step to increase your healer's healing by 25% for the whole boss fight, most groups aren't struggling with the HPS check on Stone Step anymore. So that the real challenge has been doing the Shah Courtyard cleanly and then killing the last two bosses. The last boss, the duo debuffs, the double de debuffs going out, 
the timer between those debuffs going out is being increased by a couple of seconds, which should help a lot. Uh, at the moment, it is such a tight timer for some healing specs that if you delay your dispel by one or two global cooldowns, you can fall behind and it becomes an unhealable nightmare. So that's being nerfed so it's easier to handle. Algathar Academy is also the tree boss. That's I feel like the rest of that dungeon is nowhere near as difficult as the tree boss alone is. That boss is also getting nerfed. So the difficult part about that boss at the moment is the overlap on the second set of adds. Once you've killed the big ad, the casting ad that spawns and he drops his puddle on the ground that everyone needs to be in to clear their debuff. At the moment that usually or can very often coincide with germination going out which is the ground effect that everyone must avoid. So having to be in the bubble but also avoid the ground effects is quite RNG. Sometimes the whole area that you need to be in is also an area you can't stand in so that's been holding a lot of groups back. That the timing on those abilities is being adjusted so they should no longer overlap which takes away a lot of the random or difficult aspect of that boss fight away. So I imagine Algathar Academy is going to probably go up to B tier, along with, I actually think maybe Ruby Life Pools as well. Ruby Life Pools, in my experience, has gone from being the worst dungeon by far to heal, to being one of the easiest. And it all comes down to route. And obviously like having good DPS and tanks that kick well and position well and avoid as much damage as they can and all that kind of stuff. But for me, the, the big change was to the route. The first boss is also a huge healing and damage check at the moment. She will spawn the whelps and then summon a shield around herself. And so long as the shield persists, she does AOE damage to the group. That ability is being nerfed so that the shield, I believe, is going to be 33% less. And so is the pulsing damage that goes out. So that first boss won't be as much of a wall for a lot of groups as it has been. And that alone almost puts Ruby Life pulls up to probably even B tier as well. Just because the timer in there isn't that tight and with a good route, a lot of the trash is much more manageable. So when I say a good route, there's a couple of different ones that people are cottoning onto at the moment. And that is that you can either avoid both of the dragons with a rogue and shroud and still have enough count, or you can kill the first storm dragon and avoid the second red dragon entirely. And then it's really just a matter of using your offensive purges and your stuns and things in the group and getting the kicks off for the cinder bolts and things that make the upstairs trash almost easy if handled correctly. Also Valor being in D feels like it, it really is there just because the time is very tight and it has three somewhat difficult to heal bosses. The easiest of the three seems to be Herja. Most groups seem to do a pretty good job of staying in the bubble for Eye of the Storm and still spreading out enough to not overlap the Expel Light or whatever it's called, the debuff that goes out on a single player. And healers have a pretty good idea of what cooldowns they're going to trade into the Eye of the Storm to heal through that boss fight. So that isn't a huge check for a lot of groups, or at least for my experience. What is a healing check is Fenrir. Fenrir becomes a huge burn boss. Effectively, the boss has to die before the healer runs out of cooldowns. And then the last boss has used to be almost free, but has become really quite difficult. And that is, in my experience, almost entirely down to the overlap of the second set of brands, the runic brands going out at the same time as the swords exploding. So the whole group takes a big chunk of AOE damage and then they all get a debuff on them that ticks for, I don't know, 20% of their health, 30, 40% of their health, depending on the key level. Which means if people don't do a very good job of either using personals to stay alive or getting to their runic mark extremely quickly, they'll die. So healing that fight has been difficult on some healers, especially more than others. But the rest of the dungeon is really just a matter of pulling a couple of trash packs together and that generally saves enough time to make the key somewhat timeable as long as you don't have any big mistakes wipes things like that i imagine halls of valor will stay in d maybe even go to f tier next week being tyrannical just because the last boss and like i said fenrir is going to be a real real healing hps check as for azua vaults this is the dungeon that funnily enough requires the least amount of healing out of all dungeons and yet it's in f tier it has no real healing throughput checks other than maybe gray wing but there are a couple of ways you can 
effectively avoid the back-to-back -back frost bombs going out so that healing that is really just about avoiding as much damage as possible, making sure you only ever take one tick of the ground degen, and then the healer should have enough time to top the group up between each of those casts. And so long as the crystals on the last boss are cleared properly, there isn't a great deal to heal in that dungeon. A lot of the trash is also somewhat easy, or at least easier than a lot of the other trash in Dragonflight. The real difficult part about Azua Vaults is just the timer. I imagine until the timer gets nerfed or like the timer gets increased, I imagine Azua Vaults is going to remain FT. But that's going to be it for this video. Good luck next week with Tyrannical. It should be much more manageable than the first Tyrannical week, so I imagine it's going to be somewhat of a push week again. Thanks for watching and algorithm stuff.